Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Jen Gertz, and I'm an assistant professor in our department. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, and I direct the diagnostic services at the Seattle Children's Autism Center. I'm a psychologist there, and I direct a training program um, in neurodevelopmental disabilities at the Center on Human Development and Disability at UW. And I am very excited today to introduce Dr. Mindy Minjares uh, for Grand Rounds. Dr. Minjares graduated cum laude from Claremont McKenna College and received her doctorate from the University of California Santa Barbara. She completed her pre-doctoral psychology internship and postdoctoral fellowship at Yale Child Study Center and then moved back to California to join clinical faculty at Stanford University School of Medicine um, until 2009 and we're very lucky that Dr. Minhar has decided to stay on the West Coast and move back up to Seattle in 2010. Um, where she joined um, the newly, what was then the newly established Seattle Children's Autism Center as an attending psychologist. And then she became faculty at UW here as assistant professor in psychiatry in 2015. Um, she's quickly established herself as a leader in our center and in our field. Um, she developed what was um, back then and still is a sorely needed early intervention program um, at the Autism Center and now oversees contracts with the Washington State Department of Health to replicate her model in other center-based um, ABA applied behavior analysis programs throughout our state for young children with autism. Um, she's now the director of the uh, ABA early intervention program, our clinical director, as well as our acting executive director as of last month um, of the Autism Center. And I'm uh, very excited to introduce Dr. Minhalas, who's going to be presenting on naturalistic developmental behavioral interventions for children with autism spectrum disorder. <laughs> Wow. Well, I am going to have Jen introduce every talk I ever give in the future because that was that made me sound a much more amazing than any of us probably ever feel, right? Thank you for coming, you guys. And thank you to those of you who are online. I know we have quite a few listeners online, folks that are streaming in from the Autism Center and other locations. Um, but as Jen said, we're going to talk about naturalistic developmental behavioral interventions for ASD. Um, and I'm guessing... For some of you guys, this is probably sounds like a big mouthful of mumbo jumbo, a lot of you know fancy words that you're not really sure what it means because if ASD isn't your specialty, this is probably not something that's in your daily vocabulary. Um, but we are gonna get right down to the nitty gritty of what it does mean because it really kind of represents the current state of the art in treatment, especially for young children. Um, and it's, it's really a direction that the field is moving in as far as both research um, and clinical, you know, clinical intervention for autism. Those are my only disclosures. I do do some consulting for Roche. I do have a book, which I will be talking about some today, but of course I do benefit from the sales of that book. So I have to just make sure you all know that. Um, so we're going to go through a lot of information. Um, I'm going to just talk, you know, kind of briefly about some autism statistics and the broad context of intervention, because that will contextualize why the work in the more naturalistic interventions is important um, and why that's kind of the direction that the field is going in. And briefly at the end, I'll talk about our early intervention program at Children's because uh, many folks in the community are not very familiar with what we're doing. Okay, nobody has to go to room 411, I'm hoping. Um, real quick overview on DSM. This is probably familiar to all of you, um, but just to remind you that when we went from DSM-4 to DSM-5, um, autism diagnosis got collapsed from three constructs to two. Um, and there was a number of reasons for that that we won't go into, but in autism treatment, the reason I put this up here, um, is in autism treatment, the domains that we're really most interested in as far as the core features of autism are social communication, and restricted um, and repetitive behaviors and interests. Now, certainly there's a lot of other behaviors that go along with the diagnosis of autism that are comorbid conditions and kind of comorbid behaviors, but these are the, the core diagnostic features. A few statistics in autism, um, particularly because, if you, again, if you don't work in the field of autism, you hear a lot of different things about the autism epidemic and whatnot. Um, in fact, autism has become very common in the general population and close to 2% of children are diagnosed with autism. Um, the ratio of boys to girls is four to one. So that is, uh, is obviously a very significant difference. 
Um, and a significant subset of the population is affected by intellectual disability. So about a third of kids have significant intellectual disability, about a quarter are kind of in that borderline range, um, but close to half, you know, 45-ish percent um, have average IQ. So this is one of the things that really accounts for this increase in diagnosis is kids who are quote, higher functioning as we sometimes call them, although that terminology is becoming somewhat unpopular, um, were not previously diagnosed. And so we're capturing a much broader range of kids um, in how we're diagnosing autism today, among a range of other reasons for increases that again are kind of outside of our scope. But this is all to say, part of the reason why intervention is so at the forefront, you know, in terms of everything from policy to research to clinical training is because if nearly 2% of kids have autism, we got to get these interventions disseminated. Um, and so this is one of the things I really, you know, like personally about the direction that the intervention research is going in that we're going to talk today. The movement is towards doing intervention in much more natural settings. And you can imagine that if we have this many kids diagnosed with autism, the more we can serve them in natural settings, the better, just in terms of dissemination, besides the fact that, it, that it's a more functional way to teach kids skills that they need to be using out there in the real world. So we'll talk a lot about that. Um, so some quick context for autism intervention in general. Um, one of the things that's very challenging about intervening on autism is the number of domains that we typically do programming in. You know, if you have a speech delay, we program in speech. If you have a motor delay, we program in motor skills. Uh, if you have a reading disability, we program in the area of reading. If you have autism, we potentially are programming in all of your developmental domains because although your diagnostic, the core features of your diagnosis are more restricted to those two areas we just looked at, the, the extent of those delays and the pervasiveness of those delays can be very significant. Um, so when we're talking about ABA or, or other naturalistic autism interventions, we're talking about a teaching methodology that can be applied to teaching any range of skills that a child might need to learn. That's anything from communication, you know, engagement, social skills, which are more core deficits, to behavioral challenges, life skills, you know, adaptive skills, cognitive skills, et cetera. Um, so when we make a treatment plan, we do a comprehensive evaluation of a child. We don't just look at their autism symptoms because our goal is to target all areas of developmental delay. Um, so in, in the autism world, because of this sort of pervasiveness of the areas we might need to be programming in, there's a lot of controversy and a lot of discussion about how much service, how many hours is a big thing. Um, and this has been a big thing for years and years, long before insurance started covering these services. Um, but now you can imagine with insurance really being more at the forefront of autism treatment, how many hours is a, is a key issue to accessing care? Because if insurance won't authorize the number of hours we think a child needs, then we have a problem, right? And anybody who's a healthcare practitioner knows that problem in one way or another. You don't need to know this particular version of it. Um, so, so what we talk about is intensity, but we talk about intensity not necessarily having to be defined as all the hours being spent one-to-one -one with a therapist. This is what intensity meant 20 years ago. Um, 20 years ago, autism treatment was somewhere between 20 to 40 hours of direct treatment with a therapist, which you can imagine has a ton of feasibility and dissemination problems. And so as soon as we figured out that that worked, then everybody started to say, how can we do it in a more feasible way? And how can we get this disseminated? And how can we do this you know, in the natural environment and teach parents to do it? Because 40 hours of deployment of therapists is really cumbersome. Um, and so I really, although this definition is now old, I still rely on this particular definition from the National Research Council because it talks about intensity essentially as time spent being actively engaged. And so this can be your parents have been trained in strategies that are, you know, can be effectively used to teach you. This can be your school has learned better skills. And so rather than sitting and kind of languishing in a special education class, which is what used to happen, we can, you are now actively engaged in your classroom. This can be you're going to dance class and you're, you know, maybe you're getting some support from your ABA therapist to learn how to participate. 
and then they're pulling back and you're staying engaged. We would now count that in that intensity. Um, so it's a much broader and more flexible way of thinking about the intensity, which I think enhances feasibility a lot. Um, and then of course, earlier is better. Right, um, and, and we'll talk some about this, but in autism, early intervention is a huge push because the types of skills that we're talking about and the developmental nature of the disorder is such that you know, very, very early on, the groundwork is being laid you know, in such a way that there are all kinds of cascading effects downstream if kids don't gain skills. So for example, if a child doesn't learn to imitate when they're 12 to 18 months old, which is when they should learn to imitate, sometimes sooner. You can imagine the cascading effects downstream of now you're all the skills you would have learned through imitation, you aren't going to learn. And that is a huge problem. Um, it, it makes the, it makes the you know, impact on development sort of exponential over time. And it becomes as much about the delays a child had biologically as it is about the delays that then occur because they're not able to learn in the same way from their environment as the way a typically developing child would. So the earlier we can intervene and teach those foundational skills that kids should have between 12 and 24 months, the more we prevent all that kind of downstream, you know, cascading type effect. So what we're here today to talk about is ABA. Applied Behavior Analysis, because this is considered the gold standard treatment for intervening on these areas of concern. Um, the good news is, is many more insurance plans are covering ABA these days, and we won't go into all the history of that, but there is a long history of families not being able to access care because it wasn't covered by insurance. Um, we're making progress, we're not there yet because now we have long waiting lists for kids who are still trying to access care with their insurance, but we're getting there. Um, and what we're here to talk about today is the, the different types of ABA. Um, if you have any familiarity with ABA, you will know that over time how it looks has shifted a lot. ABA 20 years ago was a very structured sort of intervention that was very adult driven, quite repetitive and kind of drill-based um, and very effective for teaching, but not very developmentally friendly. Um, and over time, ABA has really you know, shifted and changed quite a bit to take a lot more of these factors into account. And so there are now different ways that people work using ABA strategies. And this creates a lot of confusion in the field, um, but is, you know, is really represents a lot of very positive progress. And so it's, uh, it's essentially, when, when I give this talk, it's like, I feel like I'm spreading the good word of like, ABA is actually fun. If you thought it was evil, if you've heard it's bad, if you've heard it's boring, if you've heard kids tantrum, a good ABA therapist knows how to address all those concerns and make it fun. And that's what we're gonna learn about today. So a little quick background in ABA for folks who may not be familiar, although in psychiatry, people are usually generally familiar with behavioral principles, so I'll. I'll give you guys the benefit of the doubt. I'm sure you deserve it. Um, so it's, you know, these are the principles that govern learning, right? This is, this is operant conditioning. It's not new. It dates back, you know, many, many, many years. It's got a lot of evidence behind it. Um, and it's used in the treatment of many disorders, right? I mean, the B, as we all know, in CBT is the behavioral parts of the intervention. Um, so anxiety disorders, depression, eating disorders, obesity, smoking cessation, many, many places where ABA comes into play. Um, and as you guys probably know, kind of the key you know, foundational principle is using scientific methods as part of the treatment to demonstrate that you know, the behavioral changes were caused by the interventions being provided. So, so use of things like single case design is part of the treatment. That's not, you know, not just in a research context. Um, so I put this up here, although it may be old news for a lot of you, because um, this is, I think, a really helpful way to understand some of the differences in, in types of ABA or how ABA can look. This is the core framework for how we teach any skill in ABA. Um, so all it is, essentially, is us contriving or setting up opportunities for a child to engage in a targeted behavior so that we can reinforce them. So in skills acquisition, we do whatever we can, we create whatever antecedent we need to, 
to elicit a skill so that we can reinforce it and create learning and do it again and again and again until the child doesn't need that antecedent and they can do it independently. Um, and we'll, I'll show you guys lots of examples of this. Um, but the reason I, I put this up here is because we can then easily or more easily understand some of the differences because how we use this, how we, I mean, this essentially represents what we would call a teaching trial. So an example might be like a child who I'm trying to teach to point, I might hold up my water and wait for them or say water. And then I would wait for them to point or if they didn't, I might kind of prompt them to point. So water would be the A, them pointing would be the B, and then I would give them the water, that would be the C, right? And so when I give them the water, the assumption is they want it because they just requested it, and it's gonna be a reinforcer. And we have now had one trial of practicing pointing, which should increase the probability next time that you are gonna point again. Um, so we would call that a learning trial, but how we execute that can be very different depending on how we're doing treatment. Um, this is why I kind of drive this home a little bit. So, um, actually I kind of just, I'll, I'm going to gloss over this cause I just kind of did it through the example. Um, so when we sort of compare historically, like I said, ABA interventions had been done in a very, um, structured kind of a format, much more adult driven. Um, so in ABA lingo, this was discrete trial teaching and we still use discrete trial teaching all the time. Um, it very much has a place. It's used less and less in the way that it was used historically because it, we don't necessarily have to have all that structure in adult control, um, but it still looks different from a, a more naturalistic delivery. So in, in structured interventions, um, the teaching is paced and controlled by the adult. So I might say like, I, we're gonna work on pointing right now. So I'm gonna sit down with you and a handful of your things that I think you might want, and I'm gonna hold them up and, and you know, see if I can make you point and reinforce you for that with either that toy or just something I know you find reinforcing, a different toy, a food treat, something. But it's really, that's really controlled by me, right? Like I'm saying, we're gonna work on pointing right now and we're gonna do it with these materials. And here's the way in which I'm gonna reinforce you. And it's really not very child led. We can do the very same thing by just sort of turning that interaction around. We're gonna work on pointing right now, but I'm gonna sit on the floor with you and I'm gonna see what you gravitate towards, see what you're interested in. Um, and then I'm gonna harness that thing and leverage it to get you to engage with me um, so that it's much more child-led and it's much more fluid and natural to how the child might interact. But I still, at that moment, when I harness what that child is interested in, meet like, so if they reach for the train car, I might just pick it up real quick so that they then have to point to it first. At that moment, I still have the opportunity to do my A, B, and C. I'm gonna prompt you for a behavior, you're gonna hopefully make a response to me, and I'm going to give you the train car as the reinforcer. Um, so those two things can look pretty different, but they have the exact same set of components. So a couple other quick examples. Uh, this first one is one of my favorite examples because it's, it seems so obvious why the advantage would be to teach it naturalistically. So back in the day, I'm, I'm sure some people still do this, and sometimes kids need it as a primer, but back in the day, we always used to teach kids the names of familiar people with flashcards, like with photographs of those people. So we'd be like, who's this? Kids would say, grandpa. Good, it's grandpa, here's a cookie. Who's this? It's mama. Good, it's mama. Here's you know, your favorite toy. And so it's like this very unnatural way to teach something that has everything to do with natural interaction, right? Um, versus, let's say we could get grandpa and mom in the room during therapy, run to mama. Child runs to mama, gets tickles and tons of attention and reinforcement from mama for the right answer. We've still got our trial but it's completely embedded in the context of where the child needs to be using that skill. Um, it's more fun, it's more motivating, and we don't have to worry about whether the child is gonna remember, oh, that person in that flashcard is this person who I see every day because she's my mama, and remember that name, transfer that skill, because we're learning it in the natural context. Um, so, so discrete trial teaching has a place, it's a very useful tool. 
it's very, it, it leads to rapid skill acquisition. It's a very clear and predictable way to teach kids. Um, it's a little easier to implement sometimes because you kind of have more control over your environment, but it might not be that great for things like generalization, which is what I just mentioned. Like if I teach you mama on a flashcard, do you generalize that skill when you see your mom? Will you call her the right name? Or will you just think that applies to this two dimensional thing because kids with autism have a tendency for that kind of rote learning? Um, so we have a lot of challenges of that sort with, with discrete trial teaching. Um, it, it's, it's also not always as, as motivating for kids. You know, if I'm going to sit there again with like 2D objects or kind of contriving these situations in a way that isn't very naturally reinforcing, um, that could be a bit boring, right? And not so motivating. And so we could see things like increased disruptive behavior or lack of, you know, engagement. Um, and discrete trial teaching can be fun and it can be engaging when it's executed well. Um, but I think not everybody sort of remembers that that's as key of an ingredient. And so they implement it in this more pared back way, which is also just not as developmentally friendly. Like picture a two-year-old and then we're sitting at the table with flashcards and you've got basically a baby in front of you. Like that is a child who stands to gain so much from the relationship based parts of the interaction. And so this is where naturalistic developmental behavioral interventions comes into play um, is, you know, we have this whole science of ABA, um, but we also have this whole science of developmental theory. And in developmental science, we know that things like the relationship, for example, are key to learning for young kids. Um, we know that kids learn language better when the, when the interaction is affect laden than when it's not. You know, findings like that, when you sort of think about the implications for teaching in this very decontextualized way versus teaching in a more contextualized fashion, I sort of, it, like when I think about it, I sort of think about like, ABA brings this really beautiful teaching methodology and then developmental science brings this amazingly rich context that we can embed that in. So why wouldn't we marry those two, right? Like why wouldn't we put those two things together in a disorder that is social in its nature? So luckily the field thinks so too. Um, so in 2015, the American Academy of Pediatrics came out with a set of parameters for early intervention. And you can see the combination of developmental and behavioral approaches was one of the parameters that they listed, which is a very um, handy thing for those of us who are trying to bring this type of ABA into the ABA world, um, because there is some resistance about some of this, um, which I, you know, there's politics and everything else behind that. But um, it, uh, I, I think it's really, really key when we think about it from a developmental perspective. So in 2015, this paper also came out, which then has really kind of been a springboard for the field to start to say, yeah, okay, we're going to look at this as a framework. We're, we're not just going to say ABA is the thing. We're going to acknowledge that ABA does by, by nature already bring in a lot of developmental principles, but if it does so in a more intentional and clear fashion, it can just be so much richer, so much better, so much more developmentally appropriate. So we're not getting rid of the ABA at all. We're leveraging the ABA in this really developmentally rich context. Um, so this is just a way of kind of looking at, you know, what the, what the marriage of these two fields looks like. Um, and in the middle, we've got this type of intervention model. So the good news is, is there's been a ton of research going on in the autism field for at least the last 20 years moving in this direction. These are all treatment models, and we'll talk some about what the core components are. These are all treatment models that would fall under this umbrella. Um, and what has happened in autism is, you know, the, the field of autism is relatively young. I mean, the first studies that really demonstrated effectiveness of ABA in treatment were in the late 80s. So, I mean, that's, you know, although that's getting back there, which is making some of us feel old, it's not that long ago, right? Um, and so what has happened like in the 90s and in the early 2000s is multiple people in the field have kind of gone in this general direction. Um, and, and there's been communication and overlap amongst all these researchers, but these models have kind of emerged simultaneously. 
um, with a ton of overlapping concepts. And so ultimately what has occurred in the last five to eight years, I would say, is those of us who do this work have really started to kind of look around and say, oh, <laughs> you know, it's funny. That one uses all the concepts that are in this one and a few more. This one is, is really great on its own, but it's even better over here because this one is basically that plus that. And this one underlies everything. And, you know, so it's like they all, the Venn diagram is like very, very overlapping, um, which is what led to the, the publish, you know, the publication of the 2015 paper and which is what led us to then write the book. Um, because although the models, you know, have a lot of research behind them, they have a lot of, they have good empirical support. Many of them have randomized controlled trials. Um, they, there are still many, many problems with dissemination when we're talking about individual models, right? These don't all have published manuals. They all do have manuals, but not like buy on Amazon kind of manuals, which is what we really need. Um, some of them have certifications associated with them, which is a huge barrier to, you know, to dissemination. Yes, it's good in terms of quality of care, but no, it's not good in terms of dissemination. If you have to fly to, you know, Sacramento or New York to get trained in early start Denver model and spend two grand, like that is not going to be widely disseminated in community settings, right? Um, so how do we get this stuff out there was, was kind of the, the goal, um, at least that I have had with a few colleagues in the last number of years. So this is where we decided to say, okay, we, we're not, absolutely the models deserve all the credit and everything else that they deserve. It's 20 years worth of wonderful work. They all have really lovely components in them. Some of them are manualized beautifully. Some are better for parent ed. Some are better for clinician delivered. They all have their place, right? So we don't need to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but we also don't have to adhere to one particular model. We can kind of say, okay, the components in these models are X, Y, and Z, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and if we just sort of have a, a how-to set of, you know, of published materials, that is certainly going to help with dissemination. Um, and particularly if there's no certification associated with it, which was the goal of the book. Um, so we just actually um, also had a conference just week before last, last week, I'm losing track of time, um, in Orange County that was hosted by myself and the lead author. Um, and, I, and, and what I think is really salient about this conference is all of these folks presented on their model. So I didn't present on incidental teaching, Gail McGee did. I didn't present on early start Denver model, Sally Rogers did. And every one of these people that came, you know, they all have a model and they all have something to gain from that, right? They have books to sell, they have research to promote. They all came to this conference and presented on where their model fits in this picture, um, which to me was a really big, um, you know, kind of statement and piece of progress in the field where everybody could kind of come together and say like, yeah, all this stuff is great and it all has value and it all fits in a certain place and also, we can kind of pull out these core components and continue moving the field forward. Um, so, what are some of the core components, you ask? A logical next question. Um, some of these components are not specific to NDBI. Some of them are specific to ABA, um, but are things that we would never not want to have in a model that is based on behavioral principles. So manualization was one. Like I said, not all the manuals are readily available, but there, there are manuals for each one. Um, and I have a slide at the end that does show which manuals are available if folks are interested in that. One of the biggest features is this. Um, this notion that the teaching trial is embedded. And we'll, I'll give you guys some more examples of this, but embedded into play interactions, embedded into natural family routines, um, embedded into the natural environment. So we are not taking a child out of the natural environment, sitting them down at a table and doing all this highly structured intervention anymore. We are taking that intervention and inserting it into the natural environment. Um, and that's a really key feature of all the NDBI models. Um, 
having treatment fidelity is a, is a key feature of ABA in general, um, but there's a big movement towards having treatment fidelity measures that could apply across these models. So there's some research being done at University of Michigan um, that's really cool where a student is of one of the model developers is developing a tool that could be applied to any of the models to kind of say like, does it have the key features and are they being implemented correctly? So again, that kind of thing helps us with dissemination. Um, if we don't have to rely on one particular model being implemented correctly, we can sort of say, okay, yes, this is generally meeting the, the criteria. This helps us a lot. Um, and then of course, data driven decision making because any good ABA based treatment has to rely on its data. Um, so we've kind of, I think, touched on most of this, you know, that the learning targets are across any developmental domain, not specific to social communication. It's a teaching methodology. It's whatever you want to teach. Um, the learning context is within natural routines. And then of course, we're using all these development enhancing strategies. So these are some examples of instructional strategies. I'm not really going to go into these in detail because it would be more like if you wanted to learn how to do NDBI, we could spend you know, two hours just on this slide. Um, but what this does show is the combination of behavioral and developmental strategies. Um, so for example, prompting and prompt fading is a very clear ABA-based strategy. No behavior analyst would say that's not ABA. Uh, adult imitation of language play or body movements is a very clear developmentally based strategy. That's me imitating the child. And the reason for that is because when adults imitate kids, they like it and they attend. And we know that from research on typical kids. And so why wouldn't we bring that in again to treatment of children with autism? That's so not a behaviorally based principle. It's a developmental principle. Uh, but again, it, it highlights the combination of how these things fit together. Um, so let's watch a video. Um, oh yeah, we're gonna have a quick sound check for the folks or sound switch for the folks who aren't in the room to make sure they can hear it. These are not my videos. So the video disclaimer is, um, these are YouTube videos. They're actually very nicely done. So, you know, someone put them out there. So I feel it's, it's appropriate to use them. Um, uh, I'll do both of them, yeah. Um, so I'm the first gonna, video in the series. Yeah, so we can just perfect. Okay. Okay. Is over good? Okay. Um, so the first video is just a quick example of discrete trial teaching. Um, and although at first glance the two videos might look kind of similar, like there's toys present for both of them, there's an adult and a child present for both. Some of the differences are if you if you kind of look at how is the adult controlling the instruction? Um, how, whether the skills that the child is being asked to use are relevant to the context at all. Like if I say to a child, do this, and then I give them a toy, doing this bears no relevance to the context of receiving that toy, right? But if I say to a child, let's dance, do this, and they do it, and then I turn on the music so we can dance, suddenly this bears a ton of contextual relevance, you know, has a ton of contextual relevance to our activity. Um, and, and so one we would say is being delivered in a discrete trial format and one we would say is more naturalistic because of that shift in how the trial was embedded within the activity. Oh, it was, okay. Um, so we'll just look super briefly at a discrete trial example because then we're gonna spend a little longer looking at a, um, naturalistic example or maybe we won't we provide you with an overview of okay. one of the basic tools used in intensive behavioral interventions the disc oops I'm trying to turn up the the discrete trial is made up of several distinct components. Nice city. Good girl. It begins with the SD or discriminative stimulus. Do this. Or A. This is the instruction given by the therapist to the child. Next, the therapist either waits for the child to respond or provides some help in the form of a prompt if needed. Finally, once the child. Okay. In the interest of time, we're only going to look at those two examples. 
But you guys can see what I'm talking about. That was actually the exact example I just gave, right? Do this, and then she gets a doll. So do this is A, the child claps, that's B, and she gets the doll as the reinforcer, that's C. And because she's being reinforced for that behavior, she is gonna learn to make this response when the adult tells her to, but it doesn't bear any relevance to the context, right? It's a, it's a completely rote teaching interaction. So no question she's gonna learn that skill. Uh, but what we're gonna do with that skill, how she's gonna generalize that imitation to a different situation, is a little bit more questionable or might require a little bit more thinking. Um, so, it, and, and the second one too, you know, do this. Like there's, there isn't a situation where a child really actually needs to be able to touch their nose on command. That is an imitation trial, um, but again, totally out of any kind of natural context. So, okay, so how can I go to my next, next video? So we're gonna contrast that and we'll watch for a little bit longer on the next one with a video on incidental teaching. Um, so in this video, um, incidental teaching is not all of naturalistic intervention. It's sort of one you know, set of components, but it, it very nicely represents what this type of intervention looks like. And so in this video, they're gonna talk about the four components of incidental teaching, and those are not the only four components in naturalistic developmental behavioral interventions, uh, but it, it gives you a much better idea of what it looks like to embed a trial within a natural interaction and the ways in which that's engaging for the child and also the ways in which it's naturally reinforcing because the skill they use is relevant to the context and the reinforcer they receive is directly related to the skill they use. So it, it all fits together in a much more logical way. Tools used in intensive behavioral interventions. It is here. The okay. discrete trial. Oh wait, no, this is, this is the same one. The discrete trial. We can just go to the next slide and click again if that's easier. <clears throat> to make sure the online folks can. I think just being yes. at the university, there's so much. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. So this one is going to kind of lay out the components of of incidental teaching, and then it will, sh again, show a couple of examples of how it looks. Welcome to the Autism Intervention Training Video Series. In this video, we will review four basic steps used in incidental teaching. Incidental teaching is a method of instruction that makes use of opportunities that arise in a child's daily life to create a teaching moment. However, we don't just wait for those opportunities to happen. Successful incidental teaching requires careful pre-planning and structuring of the environment. So there you saw are four a trial right main there, steps even though we don't, we're not teaching. hearing her talking. Create an engaging setting. Wait for the child to initiate. Prompt the child for a fuller request. Provide the desired outcome. The first step is to create an engaging setting which will tempt the child into initiating an interaction. For example, you might place favorite toys out of reach on high shelves or in transparent containers that the child cannot open. You might give only small portions of a favorite snack or engage in sabotage, such as taking the batteries out of a toy or unplugging the TV so that the child cannot operate them without your help. During daily self-care activities, such as dressing or brushing teeth, you might wait for requests for help before offering it. The second step in incidental teaching is to wait for the child to initiate. Okay. So I think you kind of get the idea. So the trials that we're seeing there, you know, the child points to the toy, he gets the toy. The therapist presents a bin that the child can't open on purpose, which I know seems mean, but 
you know, we got to get these kids learning somehow. Uh, you know, so then the child asks for help. We do stuff like that in our program all the time. Screw top containers, clear bins with latches, stuff that's placed out of reach. Even like, I'll give you guys a few more examples in the next few slides, but like pretending to ignore the child to take notes so they have to like tap you to get your attention or say your name. All these kinds of ways that we can just set this stuff up in the natural environment um, in order to, I'll just go back to, Oh, but you have to switch back this the sound setting um in order to be able to embed those trials um so you know again when it doesn't look vastly different right but the way the principles are being used is really quite different um and has a lot of you know developmental advantages from the perspective of teaching in the context where the child needs to use the skill are we Back in the right setting. We good? All right. So we're going to look at a few examples of how that happens. Um, so I think we've already kind of touched on these particular strategies. Um, one thing I do want to say, this slide I want to um, comment on just for a minute is, when you think about motivation, you know, like which one sounds more motivating to you? Sitting on the floor and playing, like if you were a five-year-old child, sitting on the floor and playing and interacting with toys and maybe having to request or engage in some social interactions to get those toys or sitting at a table and, you know, maybe like doing one skill and then having something given to you and then having it removed for five, you know, after five seconds and then doing another thing and having it given back to you. It just sounds more fun, right? It sounds more motivating. And when you think about the disorder of autism, it's social at its core. If you have social deficits at the core of your diagnosis, presumably we can also assume that it's gonna be less motivating for you. And in fact, there are entire hypotheses of autism that are much more focused on deficits in motivation being at the core rather than deficits in social interaction. And it's, it's a bit of a chicken and an egg kind of issue. And it may be that it's different for different kids, but it's never made good sense to me that we would take a group of kids who are already, you know, prone to being socially avoidant and are already prone to low motivation and then put them in a therapy context that, that by definition has a high risk of being unmotivated, right? So, so to me, the key, one of the really key features or one of the key important aspects of more naturalistic behavioral interventions is the ways in which we can use all these additional strategies to motivate and engage kids. Just, you know, in a totally face valid way, I think that makes a lot more sense for what diagnosis we're talking about here. These are not kids who are intrinsically motivated for the things we want them to do. They are intrinsically motivated for their own agenda right? And that is the difference between a child with autism and a typically developing child. Um, so our goal becomes to provide as many of these embedded, you know, teaching or learning opportunities as we possibly can throughout all sorts of activities throughout the day. Um, I'm going to um, go to some teaching examples to kind of drive it home before we run short on time. So um, in, well, I'll go back to the slide for one second. In um, in ABA, but especially in naturalistic ABA, we talk about this concept called shared control. So we already talked about this, right? This is the teaching trial, the ABC. But shared control is what allows you to be able to reinforce the child at the end. You know, Jen already has her sandwich. If I'm like, hey, Jen, let's have a social interaction, and then I'll reward you with your sandwich. If she's a kid with autism, she's going to be like, I already have my sandwich, but thanks. You know, like, I don't need you. But if I have her sandwich, if I have shared control, she might be a lot more motivated to interact with me for a minute because she wants me to give her the sandwich. Um, and, and so we talk a lot about how can we create situations. So like handing that child that closed box is a shared control situation. Inside of it is what he wants. That's his part of the control. Our part of the control is, sorry, it's in a box and you're going to have to do something about that before you can get to what you want. Um, and so we're always looking at these strategies for how we can create this control over whatever the child has shown interest in. Um, and so the reason we call it shared is because we follow the child's lead, we look at what they're motivated for in the moment, what they're interested in, then we find a way to have some control over that 
so that it can be contingently administered as a reinforcer at the end of that teaching interaction. So how that looks um, in teaching, here are some examples, and I'll go through some different types of shared control strategies. But it can be as simple as just holding up something the child wants and then waiting. You know, a child who has a skill but maybe isn't that motivated to use it, sometimes they just need you to create the context and then they'll use it. And then you give it to them when they engage in communication. Um, if it's a child who has a little bit more skills, we might, you know, do the same thing but require them to talk instead of point or reach. Um, so, and, and these examples are, are mostly language because that just makes the examples clear. But again, these strategies can be used to teach any kind of um, skill that we want to teach. So some other strategies that we use, these are just a handful, again, to sort of illustrate. This one we call insight and out of reach. Again, it sounds a little like, you know, oh, that's tricky and maybe not nice, but makes kids have to communicate. Putting things they want in a place where they can see them but can't get them. Put their favorite snacks up on the shelf rather than down where they can get it. Place the remote control or the screens, uh, you know, again, up on the shelf, the, the phone, the iPad, all this stuff, so they can't just access it. Password thing, so they can't access it. Um, all types of strategies that have to do with just engineering the environment so that kids will have to communicate to get access to what they want. We can also do that within an activity. So, you know, like what's the first thing a kid does when they get out an activity that's in a bin? Quick dump, right? Now you have no shared control. Now it's totally in their control. Uh, but if we orchestrate that a little bit, like, oh, we're gonna color. Here's two markers for you. I've got the bin. You let me know if you need more. Easy, right? But we're gonna do stickers. Here's the first sheet. I've got a whole bunch more here, or maybe even lay them out so they can see them, but they can't quite get them. So it's all in how you set up the environment, set up the activity. Um, we talk a lot with parents about this one. This is a fancy way of saying, wait. Because all day long, parents of young kids are in the automatic mode of like, you need help with your jacket. You need help with your shoes. Here's your snack. Let me get your, you just, parents are on autopilot because little kids need help with stuff, right? That's, that's good parenting at that age, at the right age. But if the child is motivated, those are all situations where if the parent just stopped, like I have your snack and it's right here, I'm gonna wait, you're gonna have to communicate. Uh, you know, right, just insert that trial right in that routine. Um, I have your bath toys, they're right here. Oh, you're gonna have to communicate, you know. And so taking parents off autopilot is a big, a big one. Um, this one we saw briefly in the incidental teaching video. So again, like just, just getting more opportunities by breaking things up. We could dump out the whole thing of blocks or the whole thing of train tracks, or I can give you five, get you started, and then keep the box, and now you have to request more. Or I can give you five goldfish crackers in your bowl, and then when you're done eating those five, you have to request more. So you have to engage me repeatedly, because that's the nature of social interaction, right? Like how long can you go? I mean, you, you can go a long time without interacting, but it's not very functional, right? We all work in psychiatry, we know what that looks like. Um, but really how long do you go throughout the day without engaging in a social interaction? Not that long. So this is part of where, you know, when we embed all these trials, we're teaching kids also, hey, this is how it works. This is how social communication works. You don't have a choice when you're in the grocery store and someone's asking you a question. I mean, again, you can, but it's not very functional to ignore them or walk away or be rude or the more fluid kids can be with these skills, the better. I mentioned this one, intentional ignoring. So, you know, teaching kids how to gain attention, call people by name, not engage in disruptive behaviors to do this. So we might like pretend to be busy or, and then kids have to appropriately, you know, get our attention using skills that we're working on. Um, Sabotage isn't as terrible as it sounds. It's, it, the name makes it sound bad, but you know, all the ways in which we can set up, you know, give them their yogurt and then forget the spoon. Um, all the ways that we can set up activities where we're waiting for them to initiate. So this is a good strategy for, rather than me saying to you, what do you need? If I set it up that way and you know you need the spoon, I don't have to prompt you. You will have to initiate that behavior to me, which is again, a more natural way that that should work. Um, so, so I put this up here just to kind of demonstrate, you know, when people hear about this framework for intervention, especially ABA providers, a lot of them go like, oh my gosh, that's so hard though. 
Like, how do you sit with a child and all these toys? And then you have to remember like what they're working on and which toy is good for which skill and how are we going to set it all up? So this is an example of a tool that we might have a parent or a clinician use to start to kind of organize this stuff. It's not all just flying by the seat of your pants, right? You kind of have to get into a habit, get into some routines of what you're working on. So this is a classroom example, which is why it's set up with, uh, with five different kids on it. But you can see it's snack time, snack routine, five different kids, and what are they all working on that can be easily worked on during snack? You know, so there's lots of tools we have for how we can start to put, have some like semi-structure to these types of interventions without having it be all just so fly by the seat of your pants like it sounds like it could be. Um, so in our last couple minutes, just a couple quick highlights of our program. I'm not going to go into a ton of detail, but um, I just kind of wanted to, in case people are not familiar with our program, kind of say like, hey, we've got this program. Um, so as I mentioned, um, a ABA started being covered by insurance in the fairly recent past. In 2012, Medicaid started covering, which was a huge shift um, in the field for us. And so we developed a center-based um, center treatment model for young kids. So the model that we have at Children's is for kids up to the age of six. Um, they're all on Medicaid. We actually only serve Medicaid for the for the most part, there's a couple exceptions, but we'll say only for the purposes of this. Um, mm -hmm. And they're children who are diagnosed with autism who've been referred for ABA. And, and the program is designed to be short term and intensive. So, so normally in autism, ABA by definition is not short term, right? We don't cure autism. Well, first of all, we don't cure autism at all, but we don't remediate some of the deficits in autism in a very significant way in three months of treatment. Um, but we can make a lot of headway and we can also teach a lot to the parents. Um, and so our program, I'm gonna go, we'll come back to um, here. Our program consists of these components um, over the course of 12 weeks or 48 treatment days, which is what Medicaid will authorize. And the idea is, is that kids are having a really hard time getting access to care. Everybody, whether you have Medicaid or private insurance, is sitting on a waiting list right now, sometimes for years. Um, but you can imagine how much more compromised the families on Medicaid are in terms of knowing how to access the system. And so the idea behind this program was to get the kids in, get them a dose of treatment of the type that we've just talked about, um, so that we can have a really good sort of like jump start to their treatment, start getting them some functional skills, but also make a really tailored treatment plan and do as much parent training as we can so that when the parents leave, not only has a child gotten a boost while they're waiting, but also the parents have left with a set of skills that they can continue to work with the child on um, and also a set of skills about how to access services. So, you know, when we talk about a family who, you know, where the parents have immigrated to the U.S. in the last two years, they're monolingual Amharic speaking. They have no idea how the US healthcare system works. They have no social support here. They have four kids, two of them are diagnosed with autism. This might sound extreme to you, but this is the norm in our program. This is a standard case in our program. Um, and these families need all the help they can get accessing the services um, besides the fact that the kids need treatment. So the program is really meant to be much more comprehensive than just the ABA or just the naturalistic you know, behavioral interventions being delivered, but also a good dose of treatment while the kids are with us. Um, so I think that's actually a good stopping point for us because the rest of it was like more details about the program, which we can kind of gloss over. So kind of take home messages, um, take home messages that I think are important. Um, you know, this more natural kind of intervention to me represents, and I think is supported scientifically, it's not just my opinion, uh, this represents the gold standard of treatment. We can use many other strategies in ABA, like discrete trials, like many others that, you know, the ABA textbook is this thick. We can use all those things when we need them, but they should all be embedded in this, you know, developmentally rich context like the one that we've been talking about um, for the most effective intervention for young kids. Um, and you know where we go from here, I think we this field is like really in its infancy then because we haven't studied things like 
what are the, you know, the active treatment components? We, no one has done component analyses. They've only examined these things as packages. We don't have studies, you know, that are more kind of precision medicine based, predictors of treatment response, who might need this type of intervention versus that type of intervention based on their baseline characteristics. Um, like I mentioned about the procedural fidelity, we have some good measures, but we, but those are really in research form. Like we need a lot more robustness in terms of how we look at treatment integrity, um, how we train folks both in academic programs, but also in the community. Um, and then how we really look at these models in terms of access to care. You know, how do we disseminate? How do we get them in birth to three programs, in school settings, in community mental health settings? Uh, these kinds of models are not that complicated to implement in a lot of ways. Um, and there's a lot of dissemination opportunities um, that are just, you know, need to be developed essentially. So here are the manuals I mentioned. If anybody is um, interested in knowing what's out there, here's a little shameless plug for the book. It just came out in August. Um, and then this is, these are just two websites that, that periodically do comprehensive empirical um, you know, reviews of the empirical support for a variety of different autism interventions, including the naturalistic interventions. So these are very good clearing houses for, hey, is this intervention empirically supported in autism? So I know I did not leave adequate time for questions, but we're right on time. So I will stop and I'm happy to take any questions if you don't have to go, but thank you. And please, 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 um, if you wouldn't mind filling out an evaluation, that information is very helpful to me. Questions? So it was all just so clear that no one has any, any follow-up questions. Thoughts? Okay. So, um, as you, uh, you alluded to in the beginning of your presentation, there is some discussion about um, the uh, appropriateness of ABA among um, and whether or not what kind of outcomes it might lead to. And sometimes uh, even uh, autistic adults, for example, are talking about some negative experiences they have with ABA. Yeah. What do you, how do you typically respond to some of those criticisms? Yeah. So, yeah. No, it's a very good question. Um, and, I, and I think actually these naturalistic interventions have a big place in addressing that question um, because the the folks who are adults now, you know, let's say you're 25 now, you received ABA 20 years ago probably, you were probably about five, uh, and how it looked then was very different than how it looks now, uh, and it probably was even more rote and boring and structured and adult driven than I described it being now, even when we use the more structured intervention. Um, and so, you know, I think to a certain extent, there's merit to those complaints or concerns, or, uh, but I don't think those complaints or concerns represent today's version of ABA. And so, you know, when you look at a, a video of a kid playing on the floor and having some teaching interactions embedded in that, like nothing about that looks boring, aversive, or anything else, right? That looks like it would be enriching for any child, typically developing or not. Um, and so I think the, the, the more the field moves into this naturalistic domain, also the less we're concerned about some of those kinds of complaints about ABA. Um, the other thing I would say about it is sometimes we really need highly structured interventions to teach. And, and many or most things in medicine are, are not free of side effects, so to speak. So if we need a highly structured intervention to teach, and that was maybe not the most fun thing you've ever done in your life, but now you can talk. That's a pretty big trade-off, right? Like a kid with dyslexia probably doesn't love tutoring, but now you can read. That's a really big trade-off. So, I mean, as long as we're not talking about aversive procedures and, you know, procedures that are cruel in some way, which we're not, we're very clearly not, um, I, I think we have to really sort of, you know, kind of, Think in terms of a bigger picture about what type of negative effects we're actually talking about, um, and how those are different today than they were 20 years ago. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for the question. <laughs> All right, folks. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah.